Michael, welcome, man. How are you doing? We're hey, to be Carlos, asking that since we've again. been chatting for 30 minutes now. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. Thanks for asking. No, it's, it has been 30 minutes, and I, I, I feel like you should have recorded some of that, but thank you. <laughs> that isn't the record. We're putting that out for uh, for the premium subscribers. Watch out for uh, that, guys. Okay. Awesome. Man, there's been, well, you're the first repeat guest on the podcast, and I'm very happy that you're back because oh, thank I'm you. taking away how good the first episode was i think there's been a lot of development with union lately so i'll just like let you take over and talk about all the stuff that's been happening on your end because it's quite a lot yeah we, we've had it we've had a lot of progress as a project um we picked up uh, some momentum i think the last time we spoke carlos uh was right before we launched our collateral optimization product So uh, that product has been in the wild now for a little bit. Um, you know, we've gotten some uh, some feedback on it. Uh, we've now worked to expand it to different cryptocurrencies to include uh, Bitcoin and Doge and some others to be announced. Uh, so we're excited about that. Um, the um, token has uh, found new use. We uh, introduced a reward uh, mechanism in our in, in our token economics uh, which i think has uh, the community pretty excited uh, we locked up a large percentage of our floating uh, floating tokens actually within the co course of the first three days of uh, that that reward platform being live and we we're really excited to see you know uh, the participation come through um We're still pushing ahead on the uh, the crypto default swaps and our, our work with uh, smart contract protection. And that's also going live in the coming weeks. And we have some great partners we're going to be announcing in support of that work. And of course, um, we've brought on some really cool team members as well. So uh, most notably, Antonio Reyes as our uh, head of uh, marketing and business development, uh, who's going to be leading this next leg of uh, popularizing our work on the platform. So it's, there's been a lot of good stuff coming along. We've also introduced things like the Honey Badger, uh, which I think uh, has taken, uh, taken root in the community, uh, our little mascot uh, that reminds us that, uh, you know, we like, to, uh, we like to have fun too. So, uh, Man, you know, they, they do like to have fun. The memes fun. are amazing. We were talking about that off camera. Like, <laughs> the one yeah. with, with you and the Lion King, that's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, I didn't have anything to do with that. I have nothing to do with the 4chan article posts. I am not in 4chan. For anyone who thinks I'm actually responding privately, no, I'm not. I, I don't even know when these things go up. <laughs> That's what they all say. I usually find out the day after. That's... <laughs> But I mean, I, I was help. I was a part of the testing rounds for one of your upcoming products. And I have to say, mm -hmm. it, it looks pretty good. The interface is very friendly. Like th These are complex products. Like The first time I was talking to you, I had a, a hard time catching up with everything that was running in the background of Union. And now I think you managed to put that across in a very friendly manner. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we, we've we've worked really hard. I mean, our product team is really working around the clock. John is a great product manager. You know, he's a great project lead as well, you know, with the work he's doing with more. But, you know, he's still incredibly focused on making these products understandable and usable and reaching out to our community and taking, you know, proper feedback, you know, and, and letting these products evolve along the roadmap that's sensible, you know, so that we can achieve, you know, reasonable goals uh, and bring people along with the philosophy of the project and the new capabilities as we develop them. And the, um, I, I mean, needless to say, because we were talking about memes and we were talking about the way your community is, people got very passionate about the union. Uh, I, I think that's one of the things that has surprised me about this because being a relatively small project and very early stages uh i, I rarely see people get that um excited and that involved in the project oh, but i know there are a, a minority that's super loud that stands out but in general your community is very involved how, how did it come to this point I, I think that, you know, we, in the beginning, you know, we, we didn't know how to relate to the community. We didn't know how to relate to the channel. Software development is hard and blockchain development is even harder because blockchain development is immutable. Uh, software development counts on iterations and the fact that you may not get it right, but you talk to the customer and you get to go back. Uh, blockchain is a lot more waterfall. And we were trying to find early on how to integrate, you know, the, the user community voice and how much we should actually be exposing our team to the inputs of the community because 
because the community, you know, it, it can sometimes be fair weather. Ours isn't, but some projects have really been taken down by, you know, inputs that really aren't reasonable. So, you know, I think that, you know, we, we approached the community with, um, you know, uh, full contact. You know, we gave them a bear hug. They gave us a bear hug back. And, you know, we've learned to, you know, we've, we've learned to embrace each other in that way. And um, I, I think that, um, you know, they know that we as a team care about, you know, the impressions we leave and feedback they give us. And, uh, you know, that, that, that I think, you know, provides a lot more comfort, you know, even at the scale of a small project that people typically get, you know, when they're trying to engage, you know, a current a, a community and the first thing they get is a wall of admins who can't answer questions. So we're, you know, we, we, we try to provide as much, you know, transparency as we can into what we're doing. We try to, you know, solicit feedback, you know, from community members at various levels along the way. Um, our private, our private round uh, holders are still very influential in the decisions that we make and the conversations we have, and they're very supportive of, you know, the choices that we've been taking, you know, we've been making. And um, it, we, we just try to bring everyone to the table the best we can. And we think that that provides a place where they want to contribute energy when they have time. And our challenge is always finding ways to constructively take that energy back into the project. So you mentioned that you're, you know, you're involved in the public beta for one of the products. That's one of the ways that we know we can, one, engage community, two, listen to things that they need, and, um, you know, legitimize, you know, what the project is trying to achieve because you know that we have working code, we've obviated some technical risk, um, you know, and try to build on the reputation of the product, you know, product and projects, you know, for, you know, for, for you know, future endeavors. Uh, that's really key for us. The Blockchain People podcast is brought to you by Coin Payments, the world's first and leading crypto payment processor. Coin Payments serves over 70,000 merchants in over 200 nations with industry low fees since 2013. The Coin Payments wallet lets users hold over 2,000 different cryptocurrencies, which is why they're used by giants such as NordVPN and Binance. Whether you're a merchant or an individual looking to get paid in crypto, Coin Payments could be just what you need. Your project is a bit complex in the in all the good ways, I would say. But still, like for people that are used to have a very number go up approach to things, sort of like I buy this token and I hope I hope to hold it and see it go up. It um, might seem daunting to see that the project has three tokens and that there are all these dynamics and that it also involves the governance and involves the people purchasing protection you know it's a fairly complex complex project and there was a dispute within the community when you announced that you would be launching more because people felt like it would dilute the value of the of the original union project and that is a fear that i see has dissipated ever since that i don't see that being a shadow in the in the union community but how did you i mean did this ever cross your mind that adding layers of complexity on top of the project would dilute the value well, you know, when, when, whenever you're leading anything, you know, if you're one step ahead, you're visionary. If you're two steps ahead, you're crackpot, right? It's all in communicating <laughs> you know, your leadership and also maintaining I'm your like followers. Four, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, but we have to we have to explain what our thinking is. And there's sometimes yeah. when we've been very clear and consistent to our community and we've been able to say, this is why we're doing what we're doing. And there are other places where we've had to duck and cover very quickly, you know, to try to figure out tactfully how we want to be able to manage things. And, you know, regretfully, you know, more wasn't communicated as cleanly as we would have liked to the community in the beginning. Um, but we did see an early, early, early conflict in terms of what we were trying to do with protection and the role of lending in that in, in that environment. And, you lend it was never meant to be as elegant as it became. Um, and it became a point of contention. And also looking at the fact we didn't do a public raise, we realized we could do one thing well. You know, we could either follow our mandate and, you know, offer protection products and work non-competitively with lenders that we were trying to send, sell them to or, or integrate with. Um, or we could try to be all things to all people and possibly not get anything done. So that that was a risk. And um, I think that, you know, we, we responded well 
um, you know, as a team internally, but we didn't engage the community very cleanly. And we had we had floated this, you know, a couple of weeks before the actual announcement was made. And we had an AMA shortly, you know, around the time it was made. And um, we let some of the FUD sit out there perhaps a little bit too long because we thought that our conversation, our, our, our communication around these things were, 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 were sufficient. Um, I don't think that the price action around the token was largely tied to the discussion around more though. I think that, you know, we have had some predatory activity in the public market, you know, around our token. And, and uh, that's been well documented. And um, I think that what happened was an opportunist came in about four hours after we made the announcement and uh, people correlated that activity uh, of letting the, of selling tokens openly on the market when he had a very low cost basis. Uh, with dissatisfaction on the basis of the fact that you know the the lending product was being launched on its own, and I, I think that the, the the price action together with the sent the unsettled sentiment, you know, re regard you know related in what was a lot of the fud around more, and um, you know, fortunately, you know, through communication, through steady release, through you know the fact that we've been working you know very closely with community members, you know, and trying to you know explain, communicate the brand, and you know. Uh, push forward in terms of partnerships. I think that we've been able to overcome that, that people don't realize, you know, people realize that we weren't there for a money grab. You know, we're there specifically because we thought that this is the best way. And we still think that this is the best way to syndicate our products, you know, through through the crypto economy. And people are going to murder me if I don't ask you to dive deeper on this. I know that the price action hasn't been uh, what many would have expected to be with the with the token in general, but I think I also would imagine that it is not directly correlated to the more thing, because it's the kind of thing that I would, I get the feeling that it got people upset, but it wasn't precisely the people with a bigger stake in the project, because it would just draw across the point that you were willing to learn from your bouncing with reality. And I took it as a as a positive thing. But when you talk about the predatory activity in the markets, what, what have you seen? What have you documented in that regard? Uh, we, we, we really don't try to, you know, we, we really work day to day. Day, not you know, not thinking about the price of the token. I mean, of course, we think about the price of the token. We want people want we want people to be confident in their holding of the token. We want to be able to prove that there's liquidity in the token. We want to show that there's utility in the token, and we want to ultimately slow velocity within our system to drive value. That's the way projects work. Um, so we do care about prices as you know a gauge. But just like you fly a plane, you know, do you fly a plane off of you know the fuel tank, the fuel gauge, or do you also need a horizon? You also need a compass. You also need an altimeter. You know, there, there are a lot of different gauges that we use in trying to determine where we're flying this plane. And, um, you know, when we see one of the gauges, you know, plays a little funny, we focus on the other ones specifically because we know that they're steering us true. So, you know, from the perspective of price, we know that the price action is, you know, we, we've seen people, you know, early on who were given privileged positions in the project uh, take advantage of that, you know, by, by not holding while representing to us that that was, you know, their initial intent. Um, it happens. You know, the, the, every, everyone's a free agent. You know, the only people who've been locked in this project, you know, in, in, in a guaranteed way have been the team. You know, we've watched the market trade around us the entire time. I mean, everyone says, oh, I wish I got out at 15 cents. I mean, I wish I had an opportunity to get out anytime. You know, the, the bottom line is, it, you know, we're, we're committed to the product. We're committed to the vision of the ecosystem as a team generally. You know, we're not focused on, we're, we're not focused on day trading, the, you know, day trading news. That's not that's not our our strategy. So when we see members of the community who are more focused on that, we realize, look, they're different holders for different reasons. There's some people who believe in the value of insurance. There's some people who believe in the value of this as an annuity over the long term. So what we're what we're trying to do is, you know, we're we're, we're looking at, you know, we, when we have multiple tokens in the ecosystem, what we're really doing is we're appealing to different people. You know, so if you think about the person who goes long on a, an Ethereum CIO. You know, it writes to put. They believe that you know the price of Ethereum is going to go up, so that's the product that caters to someone who believes in the price of Ethereum going up. Okay, right. if you believe in the price of Union going up, hold Union. You know, but if you want to believe in the price of Ethereum going up, 
stake, uh, you know, stake, stake into C, uh, stake some USDC into, you know, the Ethereum uh, CIOP pool and, um, you know, go put some PUNN in the geyser. And we've actually shown that that makes some people money. So you, you can make multiple bets inside of our ecosystem and still be successful. Um, and we can still have an active conversation as a community. We think we leave enough opportunity for all that to happen. I think um, I think you're right about the fact that a team shouldn't be thinking about the price of the token. That's, of course, easy to say that than done, right? Because in the end of the day, it's your project and you're seeing your token go up and down and ideally <laughs> well yeah ideally is a good word here ideally you have no control over it um yeah i mean we can, do, we, can, we can put out good tokens. news we can put out good news we can hire good people we can put out good product we can manage liquidity you know at, at the treasury by by constructing incentives you talk about the future of insurance and that that's yeah that's ideally as well how people should think about this if you believe about the future of this industry in defi and about the future of insurance in general hold the token and that's also related to how do you expect the project to perform against these direct competitors right and i've seen the um, the DeFi insurance industry get a bit more populated over time. Um, so would you like to comment a little bit on the development on DeFi insurance and what are you excited that's going around? Well, you know, we're, we're, we're excited that we seem to have started a trend. You know, we, we've started a conversation where, you know, there, there, there are now more than one, uh, you know, prevalent, you know, player in the space. Um, we've um, pushed on the idea of a an insurance product that doesn't require KYC, an insurance product that is composable, an insurance product that pays 100%. Uh, you know, we, we, we brought these things to the marketplace. So the dialogue and the expectation over the course of the last eight months have shifted primarily because we spent a lot of time educating the market. Um, as a first mover in the space, you know, you always take the chance of, you know, educating the customer for the second mover. But, you know, our, our, I think that, you know, in building the loyalty that we have in the community, I think it's made a number of the conversations that we've had with larger, more traditional um, stakeholders, as well as, you know, more established DeFi projects and, um, you know, other, other parties in, in the space easier because they understand where we're coming from and we have that track record and we have that, we have that body of, you know, knowledge that sits behind us. So, um, you know, we're, we're excited about, you know, the, the education of the consumer base. We're excited about the expectation that, you know, projects should have coverage, that, you know, smart contract auditing is not sufficient in and of itself to protect a product or protect a project. And that, you know, customers should have, you know, options, you know, to, to, to protect the value locked. Um, so we're, 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 you know, user, users of DeFi, you know, have a lot in, you know, there, there's a lot of shoe leather tax in terms of understanding the protocols that you play with, understanding how the yield, you know, get yield from the protocols you interface with. Um, the risk associated with what happens once you put your tokens in a certain place should be the furthest thing from your mind, you know, because that, that, that should be table stakes. That should be taken care of, you know, at some, at some level. Someone should be able to show you a good housekeeping seal of approval and say they've done their work. But unfortunately, an audit is not sufficient, um, you know, and uh, without without financial products to back these balances, there, you know, there, there's going to be even more limited adoption as you move to conservative, more conservative, you know, user bases or, or newer, newer users who aren't as sophisticated. I see that... We had Robert Foster, Robert Foster here a while ago. He's the CTO of Armor, and that's another DeFi protection product that uh, that recently launched. And he did a walkthrough to the through their platform. We spent a, a bit talking about DeFi protection, and he would I, I agree with you on the fact that. DeFi protection or the fact that you might be investing in a faulty contract should be the farthest thing on your mind. That that should not be a worry that you have. And that sadly is a, always a possibility. So why don't you think um, DeFi insurance has gotten more popular 
or made more noise in the markets in general? I, I think that, you know, it, and this happens in everything, right? You know, insurance is a product that the, typically people don't think about existing until they need it. You know, you don't think about your health insurance until you're in hospital and you see the bill. You don't think about your car insurance until you have an accident, you know, and you realize that, you know, the, the catastrophic loss of the vehicle or, you know, the damage that you might do to something, you know, it, it creates real economic damage to yourself or the people around you. Um, people don't necessarily think about the, 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 the um, you know, the implied taxes of their, act, of their activities, um, you know, and security from a development team perspective is a non-functional requirement. You know, a lot of people would say security could be marketed. Confidence in a smart contract can be marketed. I can't tell you how many times I've heard someone say, well, you know, this smart contract works over here. We don't need to look at it so closely. You know, and I say, well, you know, you know, the fact that the contract's been used before definitely should convey confidence, certainly, but it doesn't necessarily convey accuracy as to whether you're going to have a problem with it. So these are these are real, you know, these are real things in human behavior generally that we don't think about the downside of what we do until we actually encounter it. We don't realize what the baseline is for, for you know, for a faulty contract, you know, and, and those are those are the things that, you know, insurance speaks to. And a lot of the people look at it as just a tax. You know, a lot of people would say, well, why do I need to pay a tax on the transaction? It eats up all the value. Well, what happens if the transaction, you know, goes into some form of black swan event where all of a sudden you wish you had that coverage? And that's where the tax pays off. Exactly. And well, since we're talking about smart contract protection, that's one of the things that you guys are currently working on. So can we talk about WPTC, Doge and everything that's coming from that side? Sure, sure. So, we're, we're, so one of the things that we looked at, you know, when we when we looked at DeFi, is we said, you know, DeFi really needs more people involved. We really want to see, you know, these blockchains democratize commerce the way, you know, and finance the way that they've promised to. And the truth of the matter is, you know, where someone might be able to stash five hundred dollars in a four hundred one k over the course of a month, five hundred dollars could be your gas fees hitting Uniswap. So, you know. It, DeFi is not really democratized, you know, at an economic level for a lot of people. And, you know, when we looked across, I know people are talking about the fact that we're looking to collateralize Doge and provide, you know, a great bar factor for Doge. Um, you, you, a lot of people have been drawn into, you know, cryptocurrency by mempoints recently. And they don't necessarily understand the full promise of what cryptocurrency means or what the full functionality of real tokens are. But dog, to, dog coins are very appealing to them. You know, and um, we think that, you know, this is a gateway. It's a great opportunity to engage people, to be able to pull them into more sophisticated platforms that, that, that are, provide empowerment, um, whether it be dog coins or cat coins or, you know, and, uh, you know, we, we, we look forward to supporting both. There, it's funny it's that we've never seen a cat coin That we also support up. other things like <laughs> file coins and Bitcoins and, you know, like coins going forward as well. Sorry. No, 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 I was just saying, it's funny that we've never seen a cat coin catch up. Like, it's only been dogs. Sorry, go, go ahead. That was just a... <laughs> um, we, 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 we beg to differ. So, um, you know, we're, we're <laughs> excited, you know, and we, we, have some, we, we have some good announcements coming along the lines of collateral that we're, uh, you know, a, a very, various types of collateral that we're going to be optimizing against in the near future. So um, the current round that we're in testing with are Bitcoin and Doge to support, you know, what we currently do with Ethereum. Um, the next round is soon to be announced, and I think a lot of people will be excited by that. And, and should do, I mean, can you explain a bit more about how this uh, collateralization would work in practical terms for people that might not be too familiar with all of this? Sure, sure. So in, in DeFi lending, typically, you'll go, to a, you'll go to a lender and you'll say, I want to borrow a dollar. And the DeFi lender says, well, what do you have? And you say, well, I have Bitcoin. And they say, okay, well, I'll give you, um, you know, 60% of the Bitcoin you have in dollars. And the reason why they do that is because they're concerned about the volatility, the covering the volatility of the value of your collateral should you, you know, should you not pay them back. And what we do is we provide a product that offsets the volatility risk of the collateral that's being left with lenders. Um, it's effectively an American style put option. 
So on one side, you have a borrower and they're leaving. They're, they're saying, look, there's going to be a strike price. The strike price is going to be the price at which this collateral has a minimum before the policy has to pay out. And then you have people who are long on Bitcoin, for instance, on the other side, you say, yeah, Bitcoin's never going to go that low. Let's write these policies, collect the premium for these policies, because that allows us to lever up in other places. So you'll always have someone who you'll always have someone on you know both sides of the market, people who want to go long on the market and people who want to go short on the market for any given opportunity. Yeah, I I, I was also curious about the fact that you mentioned that DeFi hasn't been completely democratized, and that is very true in the in the sense that you mentioned that. For some people, the gas fee that you would pay to make a swap in Uniswap might be more than what they're even considering putting into crypto. So that's a huge, um, yeah, that's a huge offset for them. And <clears throat> and, it's, and and by the way, it's a great opportunity for a lot of these, you know, a lot of these side chains that have been popping up. You know, smart chains are, are coming along, you know, with improved transaction fees, and it's a great point of you know competition. To be able to pull liquidity away from you know traditional DeFi environments, specifically because you know they, they are thinking about you know the, the cost efficiency of these transactions. I also feel like this plays out in the bigger scale, and this is the risk, the main reason crypto is predicated on. But of course, we haven't got there yet. Not everything is equal for everybody because the same people that haven't had access to education or financial education in general uh, would be the same people that would get excited about Dogecoin going up and would put all of their savings in it and then would suffer because, yeah, the market decided to dump all the Dogecoin at that moment. Do you see, I mean, I guess the best way to phrase this would be, where do you see DeFi protection for these kind of people, for the people without means to to level up, let's say, in say five years. So, so let's start off with a lot of people. You know, are buying houses now because of they they got in on Dogecoin early. So, you know, I think Dogecoin created a lot of wealth. And for people who got in late or people who realized, you know, it was a mem or talked themselves out of it, you know, they they, they got hurt along the way. Um, you, you can't necessarily save people from the rules of the road, right? You have to look both ways when you cross the street, you know, but you can provide pillars and fences so that they cross the street in safe places. Or, you know, they know that they're traffic lights that, you know, will slow the vehicles when they're trying to pass. Right. Um, those, those are the things that insurance can do. So what can we do? We, we, we can try to provide, you know, downside protection. You know, in the in the form of you know what is collateral optimization, so that borrowers can get more value from lenders, you know, for for the for the money that they're putting at risk. Um, we can provide these instruments, you know, to parties, you know, who have large exposures. You know, if you're holding a lot of Bitcoin in your wallet, you should have some control. You should have something protecting you from downside exposure because you're not going to be able to liquidate it, you know, when you're sitting at work. You know, a professional right. trader may be able to manipulate their, you know, may be able to trade during the day. But a lot of people who do this casually don't have the opportunity to follow the market, follow cryptocurrency trading 24-7, you know, and actively maintain their day jobs. So we can create these policies in such a way that we're ensuring balances or ensuring risk against contracts or ensuring, you know, certain activities and try, trying to just make it a little bit safer. And we can make it so that either a project can sponsor that risk or the individual could sponsor that risk, or an outsider who just wants non-correlated exposure can sponsor that risk. That, that's, that's, really what this, that's really what the UCDS represents. That, that's an interesting caveat you touched there. Um, how, how would a project sponsoring that risk look like? Well, so you could think about it as, you know, um, a say for instance, you might be, and I don't, I don't want to use a, a specific example of any of any specific project, but say, say you're a project that thinks that you're going to have a lot of TVL. The first thing you could do is you could buy smart contract protection for yourself, you know, for the purpose of business continuity. Say for instance that TVL gets lost or locked, and you're not able to access it, or you know, during the course of migration, keys get lost, and you have to be able to pay that back, or otherwise your project is crushed. So you as a, you as a as a business principal or you as a DAO, 
might think it of interest to have that protection. Now, from the perspective of a user, a user might say, well, you know, this is a lot of money to me. Maybe I want to ensure my losses on that platform independently. You as a DAO could remarket the, the you know um, a, a contract specifically focused on the re- idiosyncratic risk of your platform, and that can provide you know something along the lines of you know a loyalty program or, or something specific you know that someone knows that you think about them enough that if they have a balance or risk or et cetera, that you know you're allowing them to exercise that care for themselves. I would even imagine, and I haven't seen this play out, at least in any of the major platforms, but it would make a lot of sense, like you said, like that just as when I go to an online shop and I buy, say, a phone, I get offered to buy protection for my phone in case something happens. Mm -hmm. So it it would make a lot of sense that most platforms start integrating that same protection as an option for people when they're buying crypto. What do you think is standing in the way for from these practices being adopted more often? Well, there, there's a principal agent concern, right? If I'm selling a car with seatbelts, does that mean that the car isn't safe? No. You know? <laughs> well, we, we, we know not, yeah. Yeah, I mean, but that was the original argument, right? If I put seatbelts in the car, that must mean that the car is not safe. That I'm right. chilling, I'm chilling the marketplace. So the, the, there's there's the issue of that. Then there's the issue that, you know. A lot of a lot of projects that have the capital don't necessarily want to be deploying the capital into risk pools. They'd much rather be, you know, deploying the capital into project growth, you know, into marketing, into you know, into in, into development and expansion. Um, so, you know, it, it's one of those many categories. And until you know, insurance is out there and uh, you know proves itself reliably, and not all insurance pays. I think that that's been the crypto markets, you know, experiences that crypto insurance pays some of the time, not all the time, and not always when people want it to. Um, the until until there's this, you know, the, this expectation of performance, you know, or reasonable performance. I, I think that you're going to still have, you know, projects saying, you know, we'd rather direct the money toward building our way out or marketing our way out of the security or the privacy or or, or, or the risk concerns. Okay, yeah, but I mean that that makes a lot of sense because so far we've yet to see one major case that's covered by insurance, right? Um, you know, I, I I can't necessarily think of one. Yeah, so I I guess like it needs to become more prevalent in our culture, but as well, like you said, we don't want to think about the negative things, right? We we don't want to think just like we don't want to think about getting sick or breaking a leg or whatever. It's just a unfortunate part of our nature. Mm, no, it's, you were, it's what happens. You were mentioning something very interesting to me at this point, because I've been thinking a lot about how we tend to search for the wrong metrics in our work. And mm-hmm. I see a lot of people, particularly in crypto Twitter, now that I'm getting personally a lot more involved in there i see a lot of people that would be like tweeting all day long about monero ada ethereum just like chilling a coin all day long basically and Mm -hmm. i I get thinking about how if i'm becoming the same thing with my podcast right or if i'm becoming the same thing with another thing so what do you think are some good values or good um visions of success or metrics or of success that people should be searching for in crypto apart from well the obvious number go up well i mean we we should be looking at you know inclusion we should be looking at diversity uh we, we should be looking at functionality and utility and adoption you know the more useful crypto is the more people are going to be using it the more you'll see different faces you know at the table with different inputs different concerns being met um i think that um you know we should be measuring this in the form of education you know it's very hard to find you know good people to be able to do this work uh i think that there was just a, a uh, an article on yahoo finance about how solidity developers are hard to find um you know that that needs to that needs to drive its way down into you know in, into the workforce you know, because there are lots of people who still don't have jobs, you know, coming out of the pandemic. So I, I think that, you know, I, I think the inclusivity 
you know, uh, of the conversations, uh, the breadth of the conversations, um, the, util the utility ultimately being able to find, you know, coins in daily use, daily commerce. You know, um, those are the things that we should be looking for. You know, we're looking to transform, you know, economies. We're looking to transform the way that people interact with each other and providing, you know, goods and services. Uh, we're looking to, you know, break down uh, a lot of barriers, you know, to, you know, information access and storage and, you know, and, and you know, you know, the preservation of privacy. And I, I think, you know, decentralization has a lot of these things. It's not just about token price. You know, so if you look at a project and you say, well, if your mandate is this, how much of that have you really done? You know, how's your community growing around that? Um, that those are those are really the questions, you know, th those are really the questions I think to be asking. In particular, when it comes to this um, inclusion in the broader sense of including people from less privileged backgrounds right we were talking about off the record as well how most people in crypto don't realize how privileged we are to just like be working in our computers all day and have the liberty to be, to be shilling our shit coin of preference it, 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 it's, a lucky, it's a lucky it's, a, it's incredibly lucky at first for anyone to be doing what they love You know, it's an incredibly lucky thing, you know, during a pandemic where you have frontline workers who have to go to the supermarket to work counters, you know, who have to, you know, be pushing boxes, you know, or, or, or delivering food, you know, because they don't have any other choice exposing themselves to a virus that they can't protect themselves from, you know, who are they serving? They're serving people sitting behind computers. Uh, they're sitting people who can comfortably work from home or, you know, wealthy enough to be able to pause, you know, pause their engagement from the workforce. So, I mean, we want all voices, you know, in understanding outcomes. We don't just want some. And it's not to say that the crypto community is selfish or, you know, or, or wrong, you know, for the things that they do. Um, but, you know, they, they're, they're one input, you know, to the outcomes that we're trying to achieve, I think. I mean, yeah. And like, just like you said, we're not saying that the community is in the wrong. I mean, we're part of the community just like everyone else yeah if we if we thought we they were in the wrong we wouldn't even be here to begin yeah, with but we're, we're, we're working toward a goal we're working toward a goal where we get more voices you know where we hear more stories about someone who did pick up something like a dogecoin and now can buy a house you know those are the types of you know that 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 makes the conversation bigger or or, or get to the point like just to build upon that same statement yeah. where like the Vitalik can sell all his Shiba Inu and donate to a charity and help people aid the COVID relief in India. I mean, there have there have been good things come out of this. It's just like I reckon there's a lot of a part that insurance can play in education as well, right? Yes. You know, there, there's a lot. There's a lot to do. I, I think in the space. I think we're still early in adoption. We're still, you know, what is it? The market cap of all crypto together is still smaller than Apple. Right. So, I mean, we're, we're still so small, but we preoccupy a lot of space because of the sensationalism of the way it's covered in media and the way it's covered in news and the way that we can, you know, bring, you know, 50,000 people together into a city, you know. Because, you know, we, we, we do have common affinities, you know, and these affinities go, you know, internationally, cross-border, across, you know, race, religion, you know, for everything, you know, the, the, these, there, there's, certain, there's certain things in the ethos of the community, I think they carry well, um, you know, and the, goal, the goals of this ultimately are to make that community bigger. The way you're building insurance on top of DeFi, it's very automated. And that's one of the things that I was giving you props for that I was like, it was very easy to interact with these products. It's very easy to, to just like trigger them. And of course, if they work correctly, it's just a 100x improvement in user experience from traditional insurance. But I was hearing someone yesterday talking about this in the privacy community where people tend to be a bit more paranoid than, than the rest of us. Uh, mm -hmm. And they were saying that things can get very dystopic very fast with insurance in DeFi if people start uh, to enter KYCs into this and if there are all these sort of different metrics that track if you're university certificate is on the blockchain the, the
payments or the insurances that you're able to get or the loans or whatever are able to be tracked or to be proportional to, let's call it a social score for lack of a better word. So do you think that this industry is indeed if I can get that this topic or is this just... Well, technology is immoral, right? Technology is immoral. I mean, you can use nuclear technology to build a bomb. You can use it to power a city. You know, ultimately the outcomes, you know, reflect our, you know, our, our good moral judgments. So, you know, when you hear people saying, well, you know, we should integrate these things. The question is, well, why should you integrate them? Should you integrate them because you see an outcome that's preferable? Or do you integrate them because, you know, you see an, off, an opportunity that's perhaps profit motivated? But, you know, we should be honest in terms of why we want to bring these things together and, you know, target the outcomes we want. Uh, I worked on an AI platform uh, once where, um, you know, it was a real estate platform and uh, they were uh, clustering data uh, to try to figure out who should be renters and who should be, bar who should be homeowners. And uh, four of the six clusters that came back used race and zip code. As um, you know, as as predeterminants in in the answer, and they said, well, you know, so for this, are the, these are the models, and you say, well, yes, but are these the models that you want, or are these the models that you see? You know, because you 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 have an opinion in the way that you execute these things too. You know, you're 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 not you're you, this is, this is the difference between humans and machines. We actually have the ability to make moral judgments. You know, and you, you you have the opportunity to to say that you don't like something or something should not happen. And, um, you know, there there used to be the idea that, you know, engineers shouldn't build databases that profile or engineers shouldn't look to, you know, deprive people of opportunities through building systems that unfairly, you know, profile or extend credit or do other things. And there used to be, you know, the, the, these were these were things that used to happen. And um, I think that, you know, the, the idea that we have no sense of private self, that our information is there to be mined to manipulate us into our next marketed decision, you know, is a fatalistic one at best. You know, we still can decide every day how much more information we give. I would add to that point that, well, the beauty of these things being in the blockchain is that they're auditable by anyone, right? So at the very least, like you're providing a better way or a more transparent way for us to see all these biases. There was a story about like a human resources software that started integrating artificial intelligence and it became sexist very fast because it was like profiling employees that would fit the company's standards, which meant like 70% men were targeted towards or that men had a 70% prevalence and therefore the machine was looking for that. But yeah, I would argue with that as well, that we don't have to necessarily build technologies that reflect our, our nature as humans. Rather, we can try and push fairness through technology. Would you... Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. To your, to your point, I mean, we, 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 can, we can choose our outcomes. We can, we can look at that and say, you know, we, we still have goals that the technology isn't providing. We don't know necessarily what the baseline is. You know, we don't know what the baseline for proper behavior is. And, you know, look, inclusion may not always be the answer. But, you know, again, we don't know what the baseline is. And you're not going to get a larger economy. You're not going to get a larger crypto economy more prevalent use if you start excluding people. I think um, I think there's something that I wanted to touch also on with you. That is, um, well, you, you talked about how you found out that the lending platform was not going to be, was not to be executed the way that you originally envisioned it to be. So you, you decided to fork it into more. Uh, the, more has this inter-blockchain model built to it right it's it's gonna be also compatible with polkadot but ethereum in the base and that, that got me thinking when i was just looking at it for in preparation for this do you do you see a possibility for DeFi to become wider than the ethereum network anytime soon because i reckon that's a big uh, a big bottleneck right now right that everything's more or less happening on ethereum well, I, I mean, I think that there are pockets of, you know, pockets of utility on a lot of chains right now. Um, you know, I, I mean, I think a lot of Binance projects, for instance, 
you know, a lot of the pro- a lot of projects, you know, still have geographic favor. You know, all marketing is local. So you know, I, I think that, you know, a lot of chains have functionality that people aren't necessarily aware of. There are lots of tokens that people have to educate themselves about. But I think that right now chains poach liquidity from each other, you know, in terms of, you know, a customer here, you know, is over here and, you know, they have ETH. So ETH is the gas that they use in the Ethereum DeFi ecosystem. But if they have a pocket full of, you know, uh, of finance, they're going to be over, you know, and, you know, in the Binance ecosystem, trying to, again, do the same things. Um, I think that, you know, ultimately, you know, pooled liquidity between chains is, is a target state. I think that that's something that we want to be seeing. Um, but you know, it's sophisticated to build on one chain, yet alone cross chain. So we're, you know, people are still trying to understand the value of uh, cross chain liquidity, uh, but getting there, getting there. Absolutely. Do you see Polkadot becoming what people are expecting of it? I know some people have a, a gradually expressed more incredulity against it just because it has failed to live up to the pace of development that it originally proposed. I think every project sets itself up for, you know, for, 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 you know, disappointment by, by, by setting unfair expectations for itself. I mean, I think that it, it, there's a lot of promise there. I think they've been very good at delivering on their promise to this point. I think that there's great momentum, but, you know, a lot, it, it, software is not easy. If it was easy, everyone would build it. Right. And, you yeah, know, but it takes expertise back, back to, to the take point people who were able to do stuff. Sorry, just like adding a bit to that. In particular, this kind of software, right? That it's still like a rarity in the in the marketplace. The the, the, the biggest challenge is this, you know. With again, DeFi smart smart contracts are unforgettable. You know, are unforgiving. We could push our smart contracts out faster, but the first hack would tank the token. What makes people happier that they have software fast or that they have tokens that are you know to- tokens that appreciate? Um, the incentives the incentives within teams have to be balanced. You know, so when someone says, "Well, when are your products coming out? Why are you a week late?" Well, we're a week late because we thought we should be. Right. You know, because we thought that that was the most responsible way to be stewards of the project that you're trusting us with. You know, we, we have our justifications, but we're here to ship. We're here to ship. That's that's the goal. We want to ship. We want to ship utility. That's our incentive is to ship utility. But we don't want to ship. You know, we don't want to ship utility and tell everyone to run poolside with scissors. That would be bad. And without giving away too much, because I reckon that most of this would be things that you'd rather keep keep internal. But what would you? How does your marketing? How do you envision your marketing to look like? Oh, I think our marketing has been taking uh, been ta- been taking shape. You know, um, I, I think that we've, like I said, I think that we've been able to speak strongly to traditional finance people. You know, because of our pedigree and because of uh, the skill within our team, I think that um, you know people in larger crypto projects understand that you know we we can hold our weight in conversations. Um, I think that we you know we we do good service to smaller projects and try to help them along. I, I think we're really good you know stewards of community. I think that you know and we look to build community around what we do. So uh, we like swimming with dolphins if that makes sense. You know, we don't swim with sharks. We like swimming with dolphins. Dolphins are friendly. You know, so we, we we try to build that we try to build that ethos within our team. We try to build that ethos within our community, and uh, we we found that that helps. You know, that helps in understanding, building understanding, and endorsing the project. And that's you know what we're marketing. You know, is you know the va- the value of tools that people can trust to be there for them when they need them. I've also I've also seen that the un- the union name keeps popping up when I'm researching some projects more often than it did. Like you've been building a partnerships network that I reckon is gonna is gonna pay off in the in the long run. So would you would you like to speak to any particular partner that you have that's um, of what we would normally expect a union partner to be? Do you have anyone um, that stands no. out? Um, we're, we're, we're gonna keep that quiet. We'll keep okay. that quiet. Uh, 
you know, but uh, the truth of the matter is we we have found really, really extraordinary, you know, people and partners and, uh, you know, team members along the way. Um, you know, we're, we're thankful for all of them. We're thankful for all of them. And, you know, they, they may not necessarily make sense from the outside, but they make a lot of sense to us. So, um, you know, we're, we're, we're happy to have them. And, you know, we'll, we'll, I, I think for some of the more, um, you know, the, the, the ones that don't make sense, we'll, we'll have another conversation at some point where I'm explaining that the same way I'm explaining the more decision. <laughs> so, anything, anything you can say about Kleros, no? <laughs> um, look, you know, we start CEOP, you know, CEOP, you know, uses a chain to adjudicate whether, you know, the strike price of an option was found, you know. Um, with, um, when we start dealing with, um, smart contract protection, it requires more human adjudication and ultimately sometimes humans disagree. So the promise of what Claris represents is, is a real value, uh, to what we need in order to make sure people feel like they're being treated fairly when, pro when policies are being adjudicated on our platform. Uh, there's a real value to that. Um, Now, some people, you know, pan it, you know, make fun of it. They say, you know, it's too, uh, you know, it, perhaps too futuristic for its time. It's too ahead of its time, you know, as it goes. Um, that's not really the goal. We, we have to make, we have to make stakes in the future. Or we don't get to the future. You know, that, that, I, that's really the choice. I had Federico here on the podcast uh, from Claro's Federico asked, and he was, um, And that's the feeling that I got from him as well, that he also believes that the project is a bit ahead of its time, particularly because the tech is not here to like facilitate that arbitration such as the one that Kleros offers can happen on the Ethereum chain right now. I mean, it's too expensive to have a $40 transactions to solve $1 disputes. But like you say, these are solutions that need to be pushed right now because otherwise we don't get to the future. Well, this is exactly it. We have to make those, uh, we, we have to make those bets. I mean, you have to point at the moon to know that you're, you know, you're going to put a man there. So these are, these are the things that we have to focus on. And you know, directionally, as long as we're consistent and we improve over time, we've made those right bets. Is there anything else you want to cover before we finish this? No, I just wanted to say thank you. You know, you're you're a great guy, and you know, I appreciate you inviting me back to talk to you know you and your community, and you know, uh, looking forward to the third interview. Man, <laughs> you know, you're you're always welcome. Back. You're always welcome to the. You're always welcome back. I mean, I really enjoy talking to you every time that we talk. I, I really think that whenever we start putting out some interesting things that we have in the pipeline, we wanted to do webinars, we want to do panels, so you're always going to be invited because, yeah, yeah, you have a lot of great things to bring to the table. So if there's anything else that <laughs> you would you. like to... Thank you. If there's anything else that you'd like to say to the community before we finish? No, no, no. Uh, just to, again, appreciate their patience and their support, you know, as, as we've been growing and building and, you know, we're looking forward, you know, to, 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 um, you know, uh, living up to their expectations. Really, really, we're, we're doing some good stuff and we can't wait to share it. Hello, this was Michael Beck, everyone. <laughs>